One day your dog or cat is perfectly fine and then it seems like in the next instant they're wobbly disoriented they are having trouble moving around they have a head tilt and it can be incredibly distressing i'm dr m welcome to vmc today we are going to be diving into the topic of vestibular disease you need to know what symptoms to watch out for what to do when you notice these symptoms and what to expect from your veterinarian in these situations so join me today you'll learn something In order to understand what vestibular disease is, first you need to know about the vestibular system, also known as the vestibular apparatus. It's essentially different parts of the middle ear and the brain that are inside of your dog and your cat, and it helps them with moving their body and orienting their body in space. It's what allows our pets and ourselves to walk or run even when the ground is quite uneven or a little bit unstable. It also allows us to watch objects in motion without getting dizzy and it's what allows our bodies to realize how and when they need to right themselves. If you think about it for a moment, the fact that we're able to do all of these things is remarkable and really truly amazing. So the vestibular system as a whole is made up of some receptors in the middle ear. It also includes the brain and central nervous system. And of course, it also includes the messaging that goes from the areas that receive information and bring it to the brain so that our bodies can act on that information. In the middle ear, there are two different sets of receptors. The first one is all about rotational acceleration. So this means things like turning and tumbling. There are three semicircular canals that are filled with endolymph, a type of liquid, and there are tiny little neurological hair cells that protrude out into that liquid. When the liquid moves around because our body is moving in space, those nerve hair cells detect this movement and will send those messages from the middle ear to the brain. The second set of receptors is all about linear acceleration. This mostly pertains to things like gravity and is how our bodies know which way is up and which is down. Inside of the utricle and the saccule of the middle ear, we have tiny little otoliths, small stones or crystals that will move around in the fluid in that part of the middle ear. And when that occurs, the tiny nerve hair cells will detect those otoliths moving. And this is what will send messaging to the brain about where your body is regarding linear acceleration. So after your cat or your dog's brain receives the messages from these receptors in the middle ear, the brain will send out information to the body, like the legs, in order for the body to respond to these messages. And it happens so fast. Now that you understand how the vestibular system works, you can understand that if any part of it is malfunctioning, your pet is likely to feel unsteady, dizzy, nauseated, they can even fall completely over. So the key symptoms that you need to be watching out for include a head tilt. So instead of their head being fairly even and flat, they might have it tilted to one side or to the other. They might have nausea or vomiting from the dizziness. They might not walk very stably or as smoothly as they usually would. And sometimes when they walk, they might be going in a circle. It tends to only be in one direction, either to the left or to the right. They might be acting lethargic or tired or have other changes in behavior secondary to feeling poorly. And you may also see something that we call nystagmus. This is where the pupils, instead of being stable and steady, they will dart to one side and back again. It could be left or right, it could be up or down. It is important to know that it can seem like these symptoms have appeared suddenly and out of nowhere. They can occur in pets that even just a couple hours before were acting completely normally. All right, so if you notice any of the symptoms that I mentioned in your cat or your dog, here's what you need to do. First of all, stay calm because your cat or dog is likely to be a little bit worried and frightened because of how they're feeling and their perception of the world has just changed so dramatically and this can be quite upsetting. 
You also need to be aware that they're going to be more likely to fall and be unstable and have problems navigating. So if you need them to do some navigating, you have to be very patient and let them do it very slowly. But you may need to actually carry them because they may not be able to walk themselves and you definitely cannot allow them to do any jumping. That would be dangerous. So use a ramp and move at their pace or carry them. You will also need to make sure that you're clearing obstacles out of their path as much as you can because navigating around those to get anywhere is going to be very tough. Then you need to call your vet clinic and let them know what you're seeing. You will need to get an exam done pretty promptly on your cat or dog, depending on what the exact symptoms are and other things about your pet's medical history. That may mean an immediate emergency appointment. There may be situations that are not quite as severe or serious and depending on how busy your vet clinic is this may be something that's seen within the next eight hours or so but it does need to be done pretty promptly either immediately or within a number of hours because at the very least your animal needs medication to help them cope with these symptoms otherwise the symptoms are absolutely miserable if you talk to anybody who's had vestibular symptoms i know john green has publicly talked about middle ear problems. It's distressing and miserable to deal with and having medication to help reduce symptoms and reduce nausea is incredibly important. When I see these pets that are experiencing these symptoms, almost always the client will be saying to me that they think their animal has had a stroke. And this makes sense because if we note people that are having similar symptoms, the most likely cause for them to be having those symptoms is indeed a stroke. But vascular events like strokes are actually pretty rare in cats and dogs. So we need to talk about the other common causes that could be causing these symptoms. It's actually pretty frustrating because the most common cause for these symptoms in cats and dogs is what we call idiopathic vestibular disease. And if you've been watching videos on the channel for a while, you're probably already aware that the word idiopathic means we haven't fully figured out exactly why this is happening. And that's frustrating. There are a bunch of other possible causes, of course. You could have an animal that's experiencing an ear infection that's involving the middle ear. If there's anything that's causing inflammation or trauma to the brain, you can see these symptoms. Of course, if you have something like a tumor that's impacting the middle ear or the brain, you will also see these symptoms. Sometimes if animals have an infection like Rocky Mountain spotted fever, you might see this. And rarely, very rarely, is it because of vascular clotting issues like strokes. Now you need your veterinarian to at least rule out some of the other serious and treatable issues before we assume that this is idiopathic. So once you have your animal at a vet clinic, you need to expect the veterinarian to do a number of things because we're trying to rule in or out these common causes of vestibular disease. Depending on what the underlying causes will dramatically impact our treatment plan, so it's very important to do. And the mainstay of sorting this out starts with a very thorough neurological exam. What we're hoping this neuro exam shows us is whether or not this issue is in the middle ear or whether it's in the brain of the cat or dog we're examining. We will also need to examine down the ear canals and specifically look at the tympanic membrane, uh, also known as the eardrum, because that will give us some hints about the health of the middle ear and if there might be an ear infection as part of our problem. Sometimes we will take x-rays to get a better look at the tympanic bulla or the area around the eardrum and middle ear. We might run blood work to check for various infections and inflammatory markers. And depending on what all of those other things show us, we may need to check some imaging of the brain that might involve imaging like a CT or an MRI. 
I'm going to add a note specifically for cats because doing a very thorough exam of their pharynx as along with their ears is incredibly important. This is because cats never like to do things like other species do and they have this tendency to form these polyps which are essentially a benign growth and if that polyp is inside of the ear or the back of the throat it can be impacting their ability to balance and cause these vestibular symptoms. So ruling a polyp in or out is key for our cats. Now, whatever findings we get from these exams and possibly additional tests will guide what the treatment plan is. Obviously, any time that we need to address an underlying cause and treat that, that will be priority. But if we rule these other serious concerns out and we are left with idiopathic vestibular disease, then the focus of our treatment becomes on managing symptoms and providing supportive care. This treatment plan often includes medications for nausea. We'll use medications like Serenia paired with Ondansetron. We can also use medications for dizziness like Meclizine, and we can include medications to reduce any inflammation that might be present in the middle ear or in the brain contributing to the symptoms. This might be in the form of a steroid or maybe even a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Depending on how stressed and distressed the individual patient is, we will also add in medications to reduce situational stress. Depending on the severity, we might need to give an injection, but often this will mean oral medications that go home, like gabapentin paired with trazodone. If they aren't wanting to drink or eat, they will need hospitalized care. This will include things like IV fluids, then we can give all their medications directly into their catheter, and we can also keep them hydrated, and we can provide some nutrition support as well. Sometimes that might mean passing things like a nasogastric tube so that we aren't relying on them to willingly eat something, but that we can get food into their bodies. If their symptoms aren't so severe that they need hospitalized care, we tend to generally send these patients home. In that situation, you need to set up a room that is safe for your cat or your dog. This will be a space where you can keep it calm and dark. You might play relaxing music for them. You will also need to remove anything out of the room that they could bump against or harm themselves on. This will include anything that they might try to jump up or down from. And you will also need to make sure that they're changing body positions frequently, roughly every four hours around the clock. This is to prevent pressure sores and bed sores from forming. You will want the lighting to be a little dim so that it's relaxing and calming, but it still needs to be lit enough that they don't have any difficulty seeing objects because they're having a tough time navigating. And any time that you're needing to do any moving of them, you will need to do it very slowly and gently with a lot of patience because they can be really struggling to navigate. For larger dogs, things like help them up harness can be helpful to stabilize and move them. Lastly, you will need to ensure that they are only having access to flooring that's very grippy for them. That might mean mats, rugs, yoga mats, carpet, whatever it is, just not anything that's smooth and or slippery. And definitely no stairs and no jumping. Of course, everybody always wants to know what they should expect for recovery timeline and for prognosis because watching your cat or dog struggle like this is very distressing for you and for them. You have to keep in mind that if we find an underlying cause to their symptoms, that will dramatically impact if and when their recovery progression occurs. And that recovery for those other possibilities is very different from what we usually see for animals that have idiopathic vestibular disease. Now recovery from idiopathic vestibular disease can take time, but for most patients we do tend to see a dramatic improvement within about three days. Once we've had about two to three weeks go by, this is generally the amount of recovery that we are going to expect them to have. Some might have a lingering head tilt or maybe some other facial symptoms. For a lot of the patients, these persistent symptoms tend to be relatively mild and for a lot of them, it doesn't significantly impact their quality of life, which is wonderful. 
The key to idiopathic vestibular disease is prompt treatment with appropriate medications to manage symptoms, and then you need patience and to provide really excellent supportive care to your cat or your dog. You will do follow-up with your veterinarian to ensure that the recovery is what we're expecting them to have. There are some situations where their initial presenting neurological exam can be very challenging to figure out if the issue is stemming from the middle ear or from the brain, and over time, when we recheck a neurological exam, we can get some clarity there, which can change our treatment plan. You should also be tracking your cat or dog's quality of life during this time period. This is because experiencing these symptoms and having to deal with them can be quite distressing for these patients. And so if we aren't seeing that expected dramatic improvement within a few days, a recheck neurological exam, possibly some additional diagnostic testing, and maybe some medication changes are going to be necessary. If you've done all of those things and the symptoms continue to persist or worsen or your animal just is really struggling and their quality of life is being negatively impacted, then you will need to be discussing humane euthanasia with your veterinarian so that your pet doesn't continue to suffer. It's important to remember that for the majority of patients, that's not the case. If they have idiopathic vestibular disease, a lot of them will recover very nicely within a few weeks, and they tend to go on to have a good quality of life afterwards. Have any of your cats or dogs experienced idiopathic vestibular disease or vestibular symptoms at all? Please tell me about it. I'd love to hear. Did you notice that a specific medication for nausea was more helpful than any of the others in your individual pet? Please tell me about it. I always love to hear what your experiences have been. And if you have any questions, let me know. I also make future videos based off of your recommendations. And if you have a topic that you want more information about so make sure you comment those for me and I will look forward to seeing you in the next video. You take care. Bye bye.